Good afternoon, everybody. So we have lots to talk about. So I am delighted to be uh, here to uh, introduce our speakers for this afternoon session. This is a particularly exciting day for me because I get to walk with, work with a, a longtime colleague and friend. Um, so like all of you who are here in this room and especially like our panelists who have long focused on housing for health, I think we understand that in fact housing is health. But it's also really clear that hospitals are not housing. And that's why listening to what these two gentlemen next to me have to say is critically important. Uh, Dr. Mix Katz and Bill Pickle are both innovators who have changed things for the better for California. Uh, I am delighted that uh, Dr. Katz is now back here in New York. And I'm happy that Mr. Pickle is here for New York temporarily, and we'll see if we can uh, change that uh, transitional <laughs> situation to a more permanent housing solution for him. Uh, together, they found new and ver more efficient ways to house people with complex health care needs and house in tight housing markets, such as those in Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Katz makes you someone I've personally known for many years. Uh, his bio, I think, is before you, but just a quick highlights. Uh, a Harvard Medical School graduate who went on to become, uh, who joined the San Francisco Department of Health first as the AIDS director uh, during a time when many of us worked uh, at a time when there, uh, there was more art than science uh, to the care of patients infected with HIV and he brings uh, with him a tremendous sense of the art of clinical medicine and more importantly, the art of humanity. He went on to serve as director of the San Francisco Department of Public Health from 1997 to 2010, uh, at which time he was recruited to Los Angeles County uh, to lead the uh, Department of Health Services uh, before I had the good fortune to be able to steal him away there um, to be here in New York again in his near his home uh, borough of Brooklyn. Uh, so despite the fact that I'm from the Bronx, I am very happy to have him here. <laughs> Bill Pickle is the executive director of Brilliant Corners. Uh, this is an organization that helps provide affordable housing with services to homeless clients with complex health conditions. The word in California from those who know him both in Northern California and in Southern California, is that Bill Pickle is an eternal optimist. That he says yes to creative solutions, to big problems, and then he finds a way to make them happen. Just the kind of person we love. So speaking as a New Yorker who went to California and now with somebody who's trying to bring California, people who live in California back to New York, I'm thrilled that you're here to be part of this discussion. So thanks for flying in to be with us. Now, before turning it over to them, I wanna be clear. I don't know if we're gonna be able to replicate everything that they've been able to accomplish in California, here in New York, by definition, it's a different environment. But we need to be open. We need to be willing, we need to be eager to beg, borrow, and steal every good idea from every place that we, it, during which it emerges. We need to hear their advice and their counsel. Not only do we need to hear this advice and counsel, but as a result of their experience, Mitch, who knows that Health and Hospitals is already a partner in the affordable and supportive housing space, he can bring all of that expertise and all of that experience right here with us. So please welcome them both. I, for one, am really looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm going to start, and then uh, Bill is going to continue. Uh, so uh, my goal for our session today is to be very practical, nuts and bolts. What actually did we do? How did we do it? Um, because I think that's the best way um, from, uh, to figure out which features, as Herminia says, do apply in New York and which ones don't and what we have to adopt to make this happen. And I'm going to take it um, just by your participation that you're in favor of housing. So no 
no uh, need for me to lecture on the value of housing for health. Let's just talk about the mechanics of how, of how we did it. So uh, to explain that, I'm actually going to start, and I think this helps for New York conversation, the particular program that we did in LA actually has its roots in San Francisco. So uh, uh, I was in San Francisco as the director for 13 years before I went to LA. And we recruited from the mayor's office of housing at the time, Mark Trotz, who was a housing guy. And it was the first time I'd actually ever met as a clinician a housing person. Mostly I had met a variety of amazing homeless advocates and homeless service people. But he was the first person who articulated that his identity was housing, right? He was interested in how do you house people who are sick, which seemed to me like a great idea because as a, as a practicing physician, I knew that there were people at our hospital, San Francisco General Hospital, or at our long-term care institution, Laguna Honda Hospital, or our mental health rehab facility, who were there because we lacked supportive housing. And so I was really interested to hear this. It also begins the story of this particular niche. So uh, consistent with the fact we're all here at a housing conference, I believe that everybody should be housed and that it's horrible that at, at a point in the, that as a country in time, that this is the richest country at the richest point in time, that so many people in the US lack housing. But the part of the solution that I'm going to talk about today is housing the sick. Um, there are other sessions and other great people working on housing people who are economically poor, housing people in a variety of other settings. Um, what I've been interested in as a health person is what do I have to add to housing the people who have chronic illness, whether by chronic illness we mean diabetes and arthritis or AIDS and hepatitis C or schizophrenia and bipolar illness or lifelong addiction, people who are suffering from chronic diseases. And once you recognize that that's what this is about, one advantage we have, and we need to figure out how to best exploit in New York, is we have a funding source. So when I started in, in San Francisco, I had money. Where? I had it in the hospital, right? Because the people are in the hospital because they are waiting to go to housing. But hospital care is really, really expensive. Uh, at that time, and it's way higher now, we were working under a, a day at San Francisco General is about $1,000 a day. Um, today, an acute care hospital runs between two and $3,000 a day. A skilled nursing day um, then was about $200 a day. Now it's three to $400 a day. So my view was, OK, so I have the money. It's just the wrong pockets problem. I have to get the money from the hospital and put it into housing. And that's what we did. And over a series of, of 10 years in San Francisco, we housed 1,300 people. Um, we started mostly doing single buildings, single room occupancy hotels. Um, we would take over a hotel. It was a popular strategy in San Francisco because there were a lot of people who owned these uh, hotels. They couldn't get approvals to turn them into tourist hotels. Um, and they wanted to hold on to the investment. We would come in, we would rent all the units. We wouldn't throw anybody out, but uh, if you were there, you stayed, but then we would rent all the vacant units. Um, worked well, but then when we found that we had used those up, we began to do scatter site, um, where we would put people in apartments that match them. And we found that that was a much more flexible approach and allowed us a greater access to a private market. So when I got to Los Angeles, um, I was thinking, uh, I learned after having worked for 13 years at San Francisco, which is a city of 724,000 people. Now I'm the health uh, service director in Los Angeles, which is 10 million people, because remember it's the whole county, not just the city. Like, so I learned to times everything by 10. Um, so uh, when I got to Los Angeles, I'm like, well, if we did 1,300 units in San Francisco, we should be able to do 10 to 15,000 in Los Angeles. People thought I was absolutely crazy. This was a completely ridiculous idea. The, 
Uh, LA Health Service was already in deficit at that time, um, that how could we possibly spend money on housing when we're in deficit? And so again, it was the same educational idea. I have the money. I just have to move the money from where the people are in the hospital um, or in, in uh, LA, a very common phenomenon, we, we actually had large numbers of people who would live in our emergency room, uh, in the waiting rooms, and they'd go in and out. We had people who had been in our hospital for more than a year, uh, as occurs here in New York in health and hospitals as well. And so it's like, we're going to move these people out. And people are like, well, we're going to get the money. There's no additional money to do this. I'm like, well, I have the money. I just have to be able to move the money from one place to another. And it was on that. Our first contract um, was $234,000. And the only reason I remember it is because I got so much hassle about how I could go forward, because this was before we eliminated the deficit in LA. How could I go forward with a program that was going to spend money when I was still in deficit? Uh, and the part of my goal was to convince people, well, my budget is $3.5 billion. It isn't actually accurate within $235,000. Uh, so that's the advantages of big numbers, right? So um, people, people's concern was uh, the hospital will fill back up. Uh, if you move these people out and you spend the money and you take away the money, the hospital will fill back up. That is sometimes true. But it still works as a wrong pockets into right pockets. If you remember, if you move people out of a hospital who are decertified because they no longer need acute care, they don't belong in acute care, even if the bed fills up, if it, is, if it then fills up with someone who needs acute care, now you get the revenue. So you have a cycle in which to keep it. So we, we maintain the cycle now along the way we got some great gifts. So the Hilton Foundation uh, gave us $4 million if the uh, county would match it. And so that became $8 million for um, this project. And then we got large amounts of money, and I think this is an interesting New York conversation, because the county d needed to replace its jail and didn't want to build as large a jail and one of the things we knew is that there were mentally ill people in jail who should be in supportive housing for mentally ill people. And so we got another chunk of money for doing diversion. Then probation came to us and said, you know, your housing programs are so much better than anything we've been able to do. We'll give you a chunk of money and you do the probation. And meanwhile, in every opportunity, we're looking for other partners. So we would partner with um, nonprofits who were opening supportive housing programs, and there are wonderful nonprofits um, here. We're sitting in the front row, uh, the producer of Cambria One and Cambria Two uh, coming up, Communal Life. Uh, and we would partner with them and we'd say, okay, well, you know, guarantee us a third of the rooms for Los Angeles County hospital patients, and then I can make a financial contribution to your program. Um, we would get housing vouchers, and then we would match them for people who couldn't find housing for the amount of the voucher. So we would do a shallow subsidy. So in order to be able to do this, this work, what I needed was a partner. Um, and I had certain ideas based on our San Francisco success on what I wanted the partner to be. Uh, so one thing I did not want, and it's very hard to avoid in the housing world, is I did not want long waiting lists of people who a lot of effort is spent to keep their waiting list current, and they're never getting off the waiting list. Right? I'm fine with waiting lists as long as you have a realistic chance of getting off the waiting list. I'm not in favor of waiting lists of 15,000 people that have to be updated every six months if you're producing 100 units a year, right? So I wanted, I wanted a process that was very focused on who's in the hospital today that I can save money on, or who's in the, the jail today who needs to be diverted out, 
Um, and how can I make that person happen? I'll just say one more word about jail, because uh, I think that's uh, uh, Herminia and I for us to think about one of the big opportunities. A mentally ill client in jail, not only do we have all of the costs of incarceration, right, the security, but of course all of their medical care and all of their mental health care is 100% city funded. It's you. Right. Well, it's you. You, you pay us to, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. to care, to care for these us. people. It's both <laughs> of us. But my point is it's city, it's local city tax levy. It's money that we control. It doesn't have any rules because there, when you're in jail, you lose all your you're rights to Medicaid. So not only if you move that mentally ill person anywhere outside of the jail, all of their treatments, all of their medicines, all of their labs are reimbursed if they're Medicaid, and most people are Medicaid. Um, while they're in jail, zero. So there's a potential not only to save the costs of incarceration and all the costs that go with it, but the medical care, then you provide it, you get, you get paid. So I wanted a partner who didn't want to have long waiting lists and who, uh, from my own clinical experience in, in what sometimes people call, you know, difficult to place uh, patients, each one is a story. Each one is a person's life. Each one is, you know, like an uncle of ours or a sibling, right, or a parent who's had a rough time. There, when it comes to people who wind up staying in acute care hospitals or in skilled nursing and don't need it, there's a story, there's a reason. They can't go home, they don't have a home, they're a set of circumstances. And the cookie cutter approach doesn't work so well, right? Sometimes in, in order for them to move out uh, of the hospital, they need an apartment big enough for a caregiver. Sometimes they have a family. Sometimes they have a dog. Sometimes they have a spouse. One of our big successes um, was somebody who was so paranoid um, that he could not walk out of a lobby or go into an elevator. Um, and the solution for him was to find one of those superintendent units that exist on a lot of apartment house buildings where there's like a little stairway and often a very small apartment. He loved it, right? because he never had to go through a lobby. So he needed someone who was willing to meet clients where they were um, and provide them, find them housing, and we would pay. I had to get over a hurdle with the county in order to get that provider, which is that a typical county contract says you know, to Bill, who was my great service provider, Bill, I'll give you $600 for each person. And then if Bill needs 650, can't house the person. I go, no, that's not what I want. I want you, Bill, I want you to house people. I'm gonna give you an amount of money and we'll, we'll look at how much it costs per person. But some people might need very little. Some people might have a subsidy already, but to get them into housing, you need first month, last month. You need to put in $150 or you have to do something they need furniture, right? You need to do something. Some people may need a lot. You need to figure out what the person needs. I'm gonna tell you that here are my people. Bill, I want you to house them. Um, and so convincing the county that we could have a contract that was this nonspecific, and those of you in government know that typically a government contract will provide 26 cents per pen. Right, and they've bid it, and they've chosen the 26 cent pens, not the 28 cent pens, not the 29 cent pens. So you can imagine when I was going forward with a multi-million dollar contract saying that I don't have a unit of service here that is standard, but I'm willing to defend the overall average unit cost. But I won't require that they spend only up to a certain amount. Um, so I think I'm happy to come back, but I think, Bill, that's the right time to talk about why it was that Brilliant Corners was prepared to take such a nebulous task and turn it into, oh, I'll, I'll finish with one other point of success. Your thing says 4,000 
individuals since 2014. Actually, when I left, uh, I must have written this, this must have been older, uh, we were at 4,500. I talked to my deputy yesterday about a different issue. Former they passed, deputy. Former to, deputy, To sorry. clarify. Yes, <laughs> So my former deputy told me that uh, they passed 5,000, which for those of you who do, do system work, the nicest possible compliment uh, is that success continues after you leave a place. Right. The best possible thing is to leave a place and be able to see that the people who are there are still succeeding. So I think they're going to hit the 10,000, and they believe they're going to hit the 10,000. I believe so. Is this thing on? There we go. Well, thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, that was a fantastic introduction and many kind words. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, some of my partners in the audience, Danielle. Wildcrest, who is our chief program officer based out of our LA office, and Chris Contreras, who is the associate director of the flexible housing subsidy pool for Brilliant Corners. Um, I guess uh, I'll begin by stepping back, and, and uh, Joy is going to do the PowerPoint slide here, I'll tell you a little bit about Brilliant Corners as an organization. Uh, all set? There we go. So we're calling this operationalizing whatever it takes lessons from LA County's uh, flexible housing subsidy pool. And whatever it takes is sort of a common parlance in Los Angeles that you will hear uh, people say inside the Brilliant Corners office. You'll also hear it over at the Department of Health Services. And frankly, you'll hear it spoken at many of the intensive case management service partners. And there are dozens of intensive case management service providers that are also funded by LA County Department of Health Services and who are our key partners in the success of the flex pool. And so uh, operationalizing whatever it takes, all of the different key stakeholders in the program had to sort of always bear in mind this type of flexibility and go get it attitude, but turn it into actually systems, policies, procedures, staffing models that would actually work. Uh, so Brilliant Corners, we are uh, a supportive housing provider. We were founded in the mid 2000s in San Francisco um, at that time, uh, our initial mission uh, was limited to creating housing opportunities in the community for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And uh, we quickly, in, the, in 2007, expanded it to serve uh, other uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, but that work in that field actually prepared us very well um, to take on the challenge of creating rapid access to housing resources for people experiencing homelessness or cycling through various institutional settings. Um, we have, as an organization, housed over 5,000 people since 2008. In most cases, we're still providing the housing and the ongoing supports to those individuals and those households. And across all of our programs, I think, like many of our peer nonprofit agencies, we're using uh, uh, creative approaches to existing housing resources in the community. Uh, we are not primarily, for example, a multifamily affordable housing developer using the tax credit pipeline uh, to create those units. Um, and so we're, we have some recognition for piloting, piloting and scaling these innovative supportive housing solutions, uh, uh, the largest by far being the flexible housing subsidy pool. Uh, we're at about a $270 million budget, and um, a huge chunk of that is pass-through funds for rental subsidies, move-in assistance, security deposits, even some unit modifications. Uh, the types of flexible resources that LA County and other funding partners are providing um, uh, for these scattered site supportive housing programs to work. Um, we've, we're at 225 employees and we think that we'll exceed 300 uh, this fiscal year. Um, our two main hubs are LA and San Francisco. Uh, we have a, a development wing uh, that is primarily focused on creating resources for people moving out of California's developmental centers which are institutional settings for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we've got just shy of 200 properties that we've developed since 2008 um, in that Olmstead-driven work. Um, and, uh, and then we've got over 4,000 uh, scattered site units in other people's buildings, a mix of market rate and affordable and supportive housing locations, some with on-site uh, management and supports, uh, some with, only, with nothing on site, and we're providing, along with partners, wraparound supportive services. And we have legal control over that inventory, so we don't lose those units, typically. Thank you. So with that, we're on to the flexible housing subsidy pool. One more. So uh, 
FHSP combines housing brokerage, rent subsidy administration, and by housing brokerage, some people might be more familiar with uh, housing navigation and landlord engagement uh, as terminology, uh, ongoing housing supports, uh, and intensive case management services, uh, and the, the overarching goals of uh, the Housing for Health initiative in LA County and the flex pool within that initiative were to create 10,000 units of housing rapidly uh, uh, and to reduce inappropriate use of uh, expensive healthcare resources and other public systems, uh, to improve health outcomes uh, for vulnerable populations, and ultimately to try to end homelessness in LA County. The flexible housing subsidy pool, key partners, you can't fit them all on one, uh, one slide. It is an intensively collaborative program, um, and in spite of all the kind words, Brilliant Corners as uh, a key community-based partner, we can't succeed uh, without uh, close coordination with all of these partners. Um, so the primary government agency, obviously, is LA County Department of Health Services. But one of the really beautiful innovations, at least from our perspective as a nonprofit partner, is that from day one, uh, the pool dimension was designed so that if this new housing infrastructure was successful, it could attract investments from other county agencies, other jurisdictions, managed care plans. And so to date, we've had significant investments from LA County Department of Mental Health, LA County Probation, the new Office of Diversion and Reentry within the health agency, um, and uh, both county and city housing authorities, among others. I would also mention um, Hilton Foundation, Weingart Foundation, uh, and uh, managed care plans like LA Care. Um, and we also have partnerships with uh, several dozen intensive case management service uh, uh, providers. And so that really speaks to a key innovation here from our point of view, which is sort of a separation of the housing broker and housing support function, which Brilliant Corners provides, from the traditional case management or social work function that's also critically necessary uh, to the um, uh, getting people housed and keeping them housed. Um, and then we've got partnerships literally with hundreds of market rate and affordable housing providers, including um, uh, entities that are already managing buildings that are open and running, and the housing development pipeline on both the market rate and the affordable housing side. Um, I think next slide, shall I? Uh, so this is a little bit about our role. Uh, you can think of us as the, uh, the central housing liaison for LA County Department of Health Services and to some extent for some of those other county agencies. Uh, we get to operate under a 15-year contract. So for those of you in the audience who are uh, in the nonprofit sector, you know how remarkable and how empowering that can be. Uh, we were able to go into this program knowing that it was planning to scale over multiple years and that while there would be annual budget and sometimes mid-year budget renegotiations, uh, we had that security of a long-term contract so long as we were able to perform. Um, and I think the other thing I'd say is not just the contract duration uh, is contributing to the success of the program, uh, but the fact that it's a single contract through which multiple sources of funding are being pooled, and our organization doesn't have the same degree of administrative overhead that we might have if we were in separate contracts with probation and Department of Mental Health and on and on. Um, uh, of course, the rent subsidy administration is a critical function. Uh, and then what LA County calls property-related tenant services, which have, uh, uh, we just call housing services at Brilliant Corners, and those are oriented both towards the individual program participant or resident, as well as toward the landlords. Um, we bring a customer service um, uh, mindset to our landlord relationships in order to build and sustain a portfolio of available units. Um, this is a little bit more, some maybe duplication here about our role. Um, the first thing out of the gate is to engage landlords and secure units. And I think uh, it bears repeating or emphasis that um, we are not waiting until individuals are referred into the flexible housing subsidy pool to get out and, and uh, get onto the street and secure units. Um, uh, Chris Contreras has headed up our unit acquisition team uh, for many years now with great success. 
and part of it is that we feel empowered to go out and get units secured. We're not uh, waiting for people to be referred and we're not referring people to units. We're actually securing them and have legal control over units that we can then show to people um, until they can find something that will work for them. Um, we do coordinate a housing intake and then sort of housing plan in partnership with the intensive case management service providers. Um, we have a simple one-page application that all of our ICMS partners can help individuals to fill out, and that sort of guides us to critical things like, uh, around the individual's needs. So we are able to sort of match people with units that will work for them. Um, uh, we do coordinate, uh, so we match participants with housing units, we coordinate the lease up and the move in, uh, we manage the rent subsidy and other client assistance funds on an ongoing basis. Uh, we provide ongoing housing retention and landlord liaison services. Um, and we're able to continually adjust our strategies to market conditions. And that's really critical. And when you think about, for example, the struggle with uh, federal subsidies and the difficulty keeping pace in a hot housing market where FMRs maybe always lag behind. Um, we have the ability to adjust on the fly through constant coordination with DHS and other partners. Okay, uh, this slide gives you a little sense of the program structure and the sort of the graph on the right there shows you the interagency partnerships that we just described, but the block of orange is the sort of internal segregation of duties, if you will, within Brilliant Corners, and this is something that maybe isn't achievable without a certain degree of scale. Um, and so we're able to have a housing specialist team, and that's just a shorthand for the folks that are going to engage landlords, engage property developers, and get legally enforceable access to one or more units in their properties. Then we also have Brilliant Corners housing coordinators uh, that's our title for uh, the, the primary position in the program. Uh, housing coordinators carry caseloads that are not intensive or clinical case management caseloads, and they don't come with those credentials. Uh, they have uh, caseloads that I think started around 1 to 100, and we're currently, I think, floating around 1 to 75. We have similar programs in other jurisdictions in California that are closer to 1 to 50. A lot depends on um, the profile of the program participant population and the presence or absence of intensive case management services from a third party. Um, but those are our key people that are working with individuals. In addition, those individuals have um, intensive case management services at a 1 to 20 ratio, typically. Um, and then last but not least, and this is uh, something we were able to build out just over the past couple years as the program achieved a certain scale, we have what we're calling the Brilliant Corners Operations Team. And so much of what we are doing in our partnership with the county for the flexible housing subsidy pool is of an administrative nature. Uh, you could sometimes think of it as like we're trying to create a housing authority, a supportive housing authority, if you will. And a lot of the activities that are happening inside of Brilliant Corners have to do with rent subsidies and the reporting out on rent subsidies and other types of client assistance fund uh, funds. And so we are able to get those positions funded by LA County. We don't have to try to carve it out of a limited administrative fee because the county recognized that in this role, those typical administrative functions are actually part of the direct services of the program. That may be one way to look at it. Um, okay, so I think I wanted to say a few more words about our key partners, the intensive case management service providers. Um, it, it, I, it makes me uncomfortable when this program is discussed around the country as a Brilliant Corners program. We're very proud of our role in it, um, but there are critical elements of the success that live in the government side and then critical elements of success that live on the case management side. Um, so in addition to landlord engagement and rent subsidy admin and the property related tenant services that we provide, FHP, DHS, is funding intensive case management services for every program participant within the flexible housing subsidy pool. Um, and we coordinate with all of those ICMS providers. Um, that includes, I think, all of the, um, uh, the, what LA is divided into eight service planning areas, and within each of those eight service planning areas, there are one or more uh, coordinated entry system lead agencies, and we are partnering with all of those agencies. 
So while programs like the flexible housing subsidy pool can be very complex and can sort of uh, take a while to stabilize within an existing uh, supportive service and affordable housing system, we think that over time, they actually can have an enhancing effect. And so all of these agencies have uh, contracts with DHS that pay them a per person rate for case management and allow them to focus on the case management while we focus on the landlord engagement and the securing the units and the rent subsidy administration so they don't have that as a headache to manage while doing social work. Um, okay. I you, think. you know, just to say, I mean, I think it's, that's a key issue throughout the system is that the people who are good at housing and know all the housing stuff are not necessarily the same people who are good at clinical social work, hospital discharge, caring for homeless people. And so, I mean, I think part of what you've done is to say, look, there's an expertise around working with landlords, around keeping people in housing that's different than the expertise of providing great clinical services to people who are housed. And there's, you need both, but it's not necessarily clear that one person, one group should be doing both. And I think that's what you've nicely separated. And, and I thank you, Mitch. And I would add to that that it, these different functions could be done by one organization, but in that certain and, and that happens in some of our programs, including in Los Angeles, where we do provide case management services. Um, but I would say you still need the segregation of duties, and you need the funding streams to be able to achieve that. Asking one person to be a landlord engagement specialist, a housing coordinator, and a case manager is not functional at, at any caseload ratio, in my view. A um, couple quick things. Um, these are notes, some of my talking points for the last slide, but it, we don't have to go back. Um, you know, nuts and bolts of F FHSP in terms of eligibility, referral, and matching. You know, Brilliant Corners uh, doesn't control the eligibility determination uh, or the referral process or even the pace or volume of referrals. So one way in which the program is flexible, you know, we bring a screening in philosophy. We see our job as uh, trying to make sure that we have a, a, a wide array of community-based housing uh, resources available so that we don't have to say no to individuals who are referred into the program. Um, and in fact, there might be a, a one individual who needs on-site supportive services and they're a perfect candidate for the latest LIHTC PSH property. We have other individuals who we think can succeed in a market rate building that maybe doesn't even have on-site property management, but will bring the wraparound supports along with our ICMS providers. So we, we really do have a housing first screening in philosophy here. Um, and uh, 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 yeah, I think that covers it. Uh, so, oops, maybe go back. Yeah, this is pretty quick here, big picture stuff. Um, on a daily basis, this is how the program works. We are constantly identifying available units and engaging landlords, identifying available units, and uh, we then secure um, those units. And we secure units through a number of different um, instruments that we developed with our attorneys. Um, by the way, that's another New York connection. Our main attorney uh, works out of Buffalo, of all places, uh, William D. Camillo with Gold Farm and Littman, who's been a great partner. Um, so we actually secure these units in advance, as, as I shared, of showing the unit to in, you know, prospective tenants. Um, and we do that by uh, a document that we call an agreement to rent vacant unit. Um, we then work with DHS and the case managers to match uh, referred program participants to available units, and we'll typically do multiple showings in order to match someone with a unit that everyone, including the individual, believes is the right place for them. Um, we then coordinate lease signing, security deposit, rent payment, and move-in, again working hand-in-hand -hand with both DHS and the ICMS provider. Um, and then the tenant will receive the ongoing housing retention and case management services. A uh, little bit about how the program works for landlords, and I think uh, stepping back, I mean that's really part of the success of these types of programs is our, uh, we see our role as um, as much bringing a customer service mentality or mindset to the landlord community as we do bring a person-centered, housing-first mindset uh, to our program participants. So we're able to offer really a package of both financial and customer service incentives to potential landlord partners. 
um, they get improved collections. Um, we are typically uh, paying the rent subsidy uh, the same day every month. Uh, we can also do one-day payments when we're initially securing a unit. Um, we, can, we can manage all of that. We, we can ensure low turnover and reduce vacancy loss for, um, for landlords. And that's not just at the front end where we might use a vacant unit hold agreement and take a unit offline, if you will, while we work with DHS, with the case management partner to get somebody moved into the unit, but also if there's turnover. So in the eventuality that someone either needs to move within our portfolio or for some reason exit the program, we typically don't lose those units that we brokered access to. And the landlord, for their part, doesn't have any vacancy loss at turnover. Um, and then ease of management. And we try not to go around saying, hey, we're better to work with than the housing authorities. But the reality is that the housing authorities are um, subject to all kinds of federal rules. Uh, some have more flexibility than others in California and around the country. But typically, we're able to provide um, just an ease of management uh, relative to the housing authority for landlords. So we, we can offer a single point of contact for all tenant issues. And again, this is where that separation of duties comes in handy. That single point of contact is not with the social worker who is primarily seeing their role as an advocate for the tenant. And we're in a sort of a liaison role there where we wear both hats simultaneously and can provide customer service to the landlord while still being advocates for the housing rights um, and opportunities of the individuals we're serving. 24-hour um, emergency phone number for owners. Um, we, we really haven't had, uh, I'll look over to my partners, but I don't think that's been something where the program, uh, the program has operated so well that I don't think we're seeing a lot of you know, late night after hours emergency situations. Um, housing retention and intensive case management, which provide ongoing housing uh, stability. Um, and our goal is to maintain uh, a long-term relationship with all of these property providers. Thank you. Uh, so this, again, I think is a little duplicative. Um, just list some of the more financial incentives that we provide to landlords. We mentioned the vacant unit holds. We also have a line item for damage mitigation. Um, we also can use that to do some type of physical modification uh, to units that need uh, light accessibility mods or things like that. Um, eviction prevention funds, we're, we're always trying to obviously prevent evictions and we have the ability to keep uh, people within the portfolio even if they do move on from uh, their first unit. Um, we also, the flexible housing subsidy pool can confuse people to the extent that the primary source of rental subsidies is this new local flexible rent subsidy. But in our partnership with LA County, we're also uh, fortunate to have access uh, to quite a high number of federal subsidies uh, from not one but at least two housing authorities. And we are able to then marry those subsidies to the same package of uh, sort of landlord customer service strategies with, with you know, boots on the ground. Um, as well as some of those landlord incentives and one-time payments. Um, and, and with that, we're able to achieve um, uh, utilization of vouchers that's often very difficult in some of California's higher cost markets. Um, and then last but not least, uh, pinpointed tenant matching. Um, while we, uh, one of the advantages of having a varied and large portfolio of units at any given time um, is that we don't really have to go into a battle with a landlord if we understand that that landlord maybe isn't comfortable with a certain type of tenant, then we know that we don't want to refer people there where it won't be conducive to their long-term success. So we can kind of, again, balance that sort of advocacy for fair housing rights mindset with a landlord customer service mindset. Thank you. Um, I think... Uh, one of the ways that the FHP, the FHSP is uh, such a game changer is that it really expands supportive housing inventory across a variety of settings. So we're able to get units in both existing and planned market rate housing. We're also able to get units in both existing and critically the planned affordable housing development pipeline with over 30 projects to date that uh, DHS has negotiated a set aside of a certain number of units in, and then Brilliant Corners will enter into a master rent subsidy uh, agreement with that LIHTC provider. 
Um, we're also able, in our partnership with DHS, um, to help the county secure sites for interim and recuperative care and board and care sites. And this, again, is part of the flexibility of the portfolio where we can refer people to the setting where they're most likely to succeed. And then many people eventually will move on to supportive housing after um, interim. Um, and then the latest thing that's happening is uh, in the city of LA, there's um, a new ordinance that it will facilitate uh, the conversion of motels in a similar master leasing model. So this is a little bit look at where we're at. Um, I always tell the story about coming down to LA um, and we were in the middle of our first contract year. Uh, and by the time we got a couple people hired, uh, finished signing the contract, building out our scope of services and, and some of our internal documents, we realized we had about six months to get the first 300 units. Um, and the housing market was relatively favorable compared to now. So we were able to get 300 units in the first six months. Um, but this looks at the accomplishments to date, uh, uh, 4,200, over 4,200 people housed, over 3,700 scattered site units secured since 2013. Uh, we mentioned the investments from uh, foundations and LA Care, which has invested 20 million to serve their patients. Um, also investments from Department of Mental Health, probation, as I mentioned. And then increasing use of what I, I guess I would call uh, Federal Subsidies Plus, where we're able to provide additional incentives uh, to utilize those federal vouchers. And so from 2016, uh, 1,200 rental subsidies. As we look to where we're at today, 2018 with 3,500, and our um, budget for next year, we're forecasting 6,000 in the area of 6,000 rental subsidies. Um, and this might be a good place to mention that um, as the program continues to scale, we're currently um, acquiring, is it acquiring 200 units uh, per month? Is that, is that accurate? Yes, they're nodding over there. So that's a, just a remarkable um, level of scale, but the level of need in LA County is also remarkable. So um, I think this is sort of a little sense of with all of that accomplishment, we're moving the needle in LA County, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, the point in time count went down for the first time in four years, um, in part, but certainly not only because of the Department of Health Services um, Housing for Health program and within that the flexible housing subsidy pool. Uh, but as you can see, uh, we're still looking at staggering numbers of people and on the West Coast those are a uh, high percentage of those people are unsheltered. Um, so a lot of work to be done. Um, I, I do have a couple of closing comments that aren't up here. If I can get to it, give me one second, folks. Um, so just a couple of key takeaways from my perspective. Um, uh, you know, flexibility is king. And the flexibility that's baked into this program cuts every different way. Contracting and procurement, payment terms. Um, uh, for example, Brilliant Corners does not have to advance the rent subsidies and then seek reimbursement from the government. The rent subsidies uh, and some other program costs are advanced to us and that advance is periodically resized. That's a critical um, contracting and payment term. Um, flexibility of housing resources. You saw the different types of resources. This isn't a program that says only this type of housing resource. We can go after everything. We can also accelerate permanent supportive housing production through LIHTC using the flexible housing subsidy pool and developers are underwriting to that. Uh, flexibility about where the rent subsidy is or the so-called contract rent. We are not tied to FMRs um, and we're in constant uh, market analysis and discussion with DHS around where the rent subsidy needs to be for us to continue to succeed at this pace. Um, I guess I would say another key takeaway, culture eats strategy. Um, if I could clone uh, uh, Dr. Katz and, and Mark Trotz and all of the other people at DHS, uh, why then we would be doing these programs in jurisdictions all over California and maybe nationwide. Uh, but there is um, a culture of true partnership and wanting to succeed together that in my 20 years working with government I've not seen elsewhere. I see sparks of it that make me hopeful for the future. Um, but boy, is that important. Um, it, whatever it takes from the government side, I think, means no gotcha thinking. Um, we have partners that are interested in the outcomes, not in micromanaging outputs. Um, 
I think uh, another key takeaway, I think flex pools and similar inter innovations, they operationalize systems change uh, and create the real possibility of reaching effective zero. Um, they professionalize the housing brokerage and landlord engagement uh, dimension of this work that is so often just lumped onto the case management or social service providers without the resources that they would need to succeed in that function. I think it also promotes system change by breaking down silos and building collaboratives across systems. Uh, so you can see that we're serving a reentry population, um, we've got a diversion uh, component to the programs, um, you've got people who are transitioning uh, directly off out of the experience of homelessness, uh, so there's a lot of flexibility there and I think breaking down of those uh, silos and system barriers and, and overcoming the wrong pocket problem to some degree. Um, I think I have one more if I can see it here. Oh, um, as we launched the flexible housing subsidy pool in LA, LA already had a coordinated entry system and I think there was some heartburn uh, that has mostly been worked through. But what I would say from my point of view is that a program like the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool um, uh, gives boots on the ground and housing resources so that instead of a system that maybe is doing a great job of prioritizing the most vulnerable, but there aren't in real time the housing resources available or the staff that are needed to link people to those housing resources, FHSP sort of brings those resources to the table and we've seen, um, I think, some positive movement in the whole system in LA in terms of um, folks who initially maybe thought, wow, this is a better funded innovation and now we have to compete with it. And after a little while, everybody starts to model on it and we're always sharing our strategies and uh, around landlord engagement and so forth with the housing authorities and all of our partners. So with that, I think wrap it up and leave time for questions. Moderate questions? Yeah, absolutely. So, we have had lots of discussion. It's a full room. If we. So there's a mic. Maybe mic in the front, line up. Maybe people should line up. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, I have like a ton of questions, so I'm going well, um, to, and I'm from Westchester County, so my mindset is slightly different than the city. So, so I'm going to execute. So if people could just sort of say their name if you want your organization, okay. and let's, because I want to make sure that everybody's got questions, let's try to get, get to like one question, and then if there's time, you can come around. I don't think it's on, but I don't know that I need it. I could just, yeah, it is on. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm Annette Peters. I'm from Westchester County um, Department of Community Mental Health, but I'm also the co-chair of our COC there. Um, so one question that I wasn't familiar with, the, um, the term of unit holds. Um, does that mean Brilliant Corners holds the lease on these scattered site units? Yeah. we. Um, uh, we knew that to be successful and to continue to scale, we would need to be able to acquire units in advance of people being referred. And in so many programs, including programs that Brilliant Corners is involved in, in San Francisco and other jurisdictions, part of the challenge is uh, when you need the unit for the person, the unit isn't there and vice versa, right? So this just uh, is a simple tool that we developed. Uh, we call it an agreement to rent a vacant unit. Um, we're signing, <laughs> it feels like dozens of them every day. They come, the PDFs come across my email. Um, and then, and I think this is where your question goes, um, for I think still 100% of our flexible housing subsidy pool program participants, when we do match an individual with the unit, they execute a lease and Brilliant Corners is neither uh, in the role of landlord or in the role of tenant. And, and, and we're not subleasing. We have many other programs where we do that, where we corporate lease and sublease to our program participant. Uh, we are willing to do that where that's necessary. But so far, this uh, alternative structure has worked better. Um, we think it's good for our organization. It kind of keeps us out of a legal no man's land where we're in terms of housing law. But we also think it's got fidelity to a housing first model where people are holding their own lease. But I'm sorry, but you did say, but you. But you pay the subsidy. You're paying the landlord 
but you don't hold the lease. That's correct. And it's, we modeled that. Uh, initially, we had a very big, intimidating document that our attorneys came up with. Uh, and we were able to sort of whittle that down so that it looks very similar to um, a housing authority contract that a landlord might. Uh, it's just that it's got all kinds of different assurances that we're able to provide in addition to saying we're going to pay X percentage of the rent. And I'm assuming because of the scale, you're able to match because we find that a lot of, when we have available units, nobody wants those units. They want to live in a different part of Westchester. And so it's like it's trying to match the people with the units. But I'm assuming you have so many units that are on hold that you have a variety to, to show people. I think staff enjoy it when I make really difficult things sound like they're easy. But yes, we are able to, uh, we are able eventually to uh, show people that, I mean, we don't have the staff time to uh, uh, show people an infant number of units. So we're really hopeful that through uh, an individualized housing plan and through conversations not only with the program participant but the intensive case management partner, that we're showing people units that they're likely to want to take. Having said that, some people, in spite of the situation that they find themselves in, can hold out uh, occasionally for an unrealistic expectation. Uh, but typically, the inventory helps us, yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosa Gill, and I'm the president and CEO of Community Living. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Katz, uh, Mr. Pinkel, and Deputy Mayor, for presenting us different models and experience and, and outcomes in LA regarding housing and the work that you all have done with hospitals. Uh, a couple of questions, uh, primarily around uh, the, uh, what I call transition or those beds that you identify as recuperative. Um, could, could you tell us a little bit about who are those patients or those clients that are there? You know, are they patients that are challenged with mental illness uh, are, or are they coming from medicine from uh, different parts of the hospital? Yeah. And I mean, we call them here respite uh, program. A community Live actually has the, the first respite program in the city of New York. And I'm just um, kind of interested to know, uh, first of all, what is the savings to the hospital for a respite bed? In, in your in, in LA well Rosa first I want everyone to know you know how much I admire the programs that you've created for supportive housing you've been a real pioneer in New York and and I look forward to working with you so um, what in an ideal world at least my ideal world um, everything would be direct access to housing right but in the real world it's very hard to take somebody who's got medical illness and mental health illness and may not even have a driver's license and take them from an acute care hospital and put them in housing. You know this. Um, and especially because part of the, the savings is getting people out of, ho out of the hospital quickly, right? So if I say, okay, well, we, ha we have a housing unit. This person just stays in the hospital for three weeks. Right, I'm eating all my savings uh, that comes from housing them. So we opened up, uh, well first, even before I got there, LA had a respite unit uh, with Wine Garden, and we opened up two more. Um, and we like to th think of them as sort of launching pads, that they're, they're the place where either it's people who no longer have an acute need, but but needs so much care that it would be hard to organize in a home, uh, and or they need some stuff before we can get them housed. They need a driver's license, they need an SSI application, and so we do it. Um, in California, respite care is not a reimbursable service. And so um, for the county side, it's 100% general fund. Um, and it only will work so long as I have enough, or I had enough, egress. One of my concerns about it was, I'm not going to create a 30-bed respite, and then you're going to tell me that the people can't leave, Cause, because it's, it's still too expensive. Um, but I'm willing to create it as this launching pad. Um, and so that, that's what we did. I do understand in New York State, there is a respite for level type care that can be reimbursed 
for people through the state, for people with severe mental illness. And I want to look more at that. Does, does that answer your question, Rosa? Or do you want to say more about what you, what you know about this issue? Um, no, I, I'm just curious, uh, uh, because at least the patients that we serve in the respite program, there are patients who are medically clear from the hospital. Uh, when they came in, um, they may have had a home. They were uh, with friends, and then at the time of discharge, the family of the friends said, that we don't want you anymore here. Right. So then, actually, while the patient is, is in the hospital, he become homeless. homeless. Um, the respite program that we have is not funded by government. It's funded by hospitals. Mm -hmm. And throughout the country, the uh, respite programs, uh, as we know, as a matter of fact, which, I mean, um, uh, Connecticut has a very good program, uh, Boston has a program where uh, hospitals are the one who are paying for the respite program, Dr. Katz, because it's much uh, Cheaper uh, less expensive cute. to pay for a respite bed, um, you know, with an exit, I call it an exit in my program, because we do place them in different housing options. Uh, so I was just curious as to yeah. uh, how, how did you... Uh, I think, Rosa, we should think of it as part of the New York City solution, which is not sure yet where, what, what the different parts of that solution will be. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, for being here. And maybe, I don't know, uh, could it be possible to copycat a little bit the contracting scheme <laughs> from LA? <laughs> thank you, Rosa. <laughs> Uh, hello, Deputy Mayor, uh, Dr. Katz, and Mr. Pickle. My name is Matthew Duomalfa. I work with the New York State Department of Health. Uh, Mr. Pickle, I was just wondering if you could please describe uh, how the amount of rental subsidy for each participant in your program uh, is determined, and some details about that, if you use HUD FMR, if you're allowed to go above that, things of that nature. Chris, would you be nervous if I put you on the spot and say a little bit about how the uh, the contract rent and the subsidy amounts are determined for a flex pool? Yeah, no, sure. Um, I think I can speak loud about that. So um, our rental subsidies, we do use HUD FMR. Uh, we have two sets of different FMR levels. One is for the county, which is set by HUD, and then our local housing authority for the city takes those numbers uh, and spits out another set of FMR levels for the city. So we can go up to those FMR levels. Um, what's nice about the flexible housing subsidy pool, though, and DHS, is that the Department of Health Services allows us to go above that FMR cap, um, especially when it comes to units that are accessible to clients. So if there's an ADA accessible unit somewhere in the county, we could probably go up to 110% of FMR to speed that up. Um, in terms of the actual rental subsidy that we're playing, um, clients pay 30% of their income for rent, we subsidize the rest. Uh, the only time where we're paying the entire portion of the rent is when it's under an agreement regarding the unit, um, and that's where we're paying the entire unit. Thank you, Chris. Thank uh, you. A, another benefit of a 15-year contract that's designed to scale is you can attract and retain really great talent on the workforce. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon. My name is Meryl Weinberg, and I'm with Metro Plus Health Plan. I wanted to ask you a question. Has Kaiser or any of the other managed care plans participated in the LA program in terms of supporting their members to keep them healthier and housed, or housed and then healthier, and reduce the gaps in care? So LA Care, as Bill mentioned, which is the oh, one the of the two managed care health plans. Um, so uh, uh, California did their managed Medicaid as a two-plan model, one uh, that is quasi-governmental, which is LA Care, and one that's private sector, which is what used to be HealthNet and is now something else uh, got bought. Anyway, um, so they gave uh, a significant amount on their charitable side, though, not, not as a service issue. Right. I think the, the challenge has always been um, we haven't yet gotten where we've said, okay, we will house X of your people. Um, so it's more, it's more they're helping the overall program. But I think it's worth thinking about in the New York context as to whether that can be one of the funders. And are you aware of Kaiser doing anything? 
Well, there's some conversations with Kaiser in, in California, and the FlexPool and some similar programs have created enough buzz that, um, you know, from my perspective, it's nice, I think, mostly when you think uh, hospitals and supportive housing, you, you think of investments in buildings, which is a great strategy. But we're excited to see multiple health plans looking at these scattered site models, which can provide rapid access and, and great flexibility of the housing inventory. We do partner in um, the Inland Empire, uh, which is east of LA County, a two county program with the Inland Empire Health Plan that's modeled in part on the flexible housing subsidy pool. And then we have a very slow growing program um, that's really very cool with the health plan of San Mateo County. And, and they have very similar features of landlord engagement, rent subsidy administration, ongoing tenant supports. Bill, one of the things you remind me of with, the, with this question of one of the challenges in getting insurers to pay but also one of the great things about this program, not so much brilliant corners, but health services, is our view is we will never throw anybody out of this program. The program does not end. Um, and even in my you know, little bit of watching what happens in, in health and hospitals in New York City, there is a group of very distressed people who go psychiatric hospitalization often at MET, shelter, what is the shelter in the water that's 90, not on the one, 91st Street is a, right, and then jail. And they cycle among these three places, and each time there's a different treatment team and different people to meet. And one of the things that we've tried and the intensive case management group does, the services, is the idea that if we, if we H, uh, Department of Health Services in LA, took you in. We're not throwing you out. It doesn't end. If you graduate, that would be great. Um, uh, we, don't, we have very high retention. We don't have a huge amount of true graduation into 100% supporting yourself because we tend to take people who are quite sick, uh, often who've been homeless for long periods of time. Um, so I think, I mean, one of the challenges to the Kaisers of the world is they say, well, but we're not responsible for them for Forever. that length of Forever. time. Right. Uh, and I get that. Um, but, but we feel that if the programs that end, right, for people who are under a lot of distress will never succeed, that you have to be, you have to not graduate them until they are ready to be graduated. The, the last thing I'll say is the fear that I think a plan might have is there's so much transition from plan to plan. So if you right. do own that patient and you are responsible and participating in this, where does that go? And right. Lots of questions. Understood. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is William Wilcox. I'm from Bronx Works. We're a large homeless services provider. Um, and we actually run a drop-in center uh, in the Bronx where we see a lot of the most vulnerable people who don't make it through to the intake center or leave the hospital um, and have a lot of complicated needs um, and end up sleeping in chairs, uh, which is a big challenge we face. But I was wondering how you see, um, Deputy Mayor Palacio and uh, Dr. Katz, how you see the city uh, and providing medical services for people who need recuperative care um, and need maybe have complex medical needs while we have a lot of supportive housing for people with behavioral health needs, the needs of people with more complex medical long-term challenges has sort of been left up in the air from the city perspective. So I'll begin and then I'll, I'll turn it over. And I wanted to tie together a few of the threads in terms of places where I think we can learn some real lessons and questions and some of the distinctions that you've heard a little bit about sort of the, the broader LA County environment and in particular your last slide in terms of the overall homelessness number, which in terms of the total homeless population is not that different, but in terms of the proportion of housed to unhoused is remarkably different. And whereas, uh, you know, to your point, in terms of thinking about the multiple places and the multiple units that we're trying to secure, one of the, uh, one of the real challenges here in New York is we are trying to secure not just these very critical units for people who need supportive housing, but we're simultaneously trying to secure both supportive and affordable units for 
uh, folks writ large, right? We're trying to exit people not just from long stays at the hospital, we're trying to exit people from our shelters, and in fact, our, our exit rate from our shelters into affordable housing is still pretty substantial. So as opposed to 50,000 people or 40,000 people on the street, as you here in New York know that we have, you know, fewer than 4,000 people who are on the street and we've got many robust programs there. So the answer to your question is, I think, is a little bit of what Mick said. This is like, this has to be a multifaceted approach to putting multiple pieces where we can. This focus was, is critically important, which is really about what is the unique role that a hospital can play, both in terms of making sure that the people within its four walls are in a hospital are actually the right people in its four walls, right? The people who need acute care, the people who need a skilled nursing facility, and what role can they play in um, using those resources that the cities give, those non-reimbursable resources other than city tax levy, which is what what Dr. Katz is using to keep those people in the hospital, how can we redirect some of those into, a, into the broader market? The broader market being tighter overall than it is in LA and being competed for for many other uh, opportunities because we're right to shelter. So I think we're here because, you know, if we'd had figured out the easy problem to this, we would have done fixed it, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a... There's not a lack of will or genuine commitment, um, but we're hoping to be able to extract some nuggets uh, that can be applied and scaled here in New York City. That's it. The only thing I, I would add, which is where really where we began, is that that one, but not your only challenge in moving people out of shelter to housing is money. You have money and Available units. It's, uh, Both. Yes, it's right. Available units, probably even more. You than think money. more. So I mean, the one thing that that health can, which is crazy in and of itself, right. right, is that we're spending large amounts of money. We might actually even be able to show a savings on if we could turn it in. But it does go back to are the units available? And if the units, right, if there simply is no place. To, in, to house people, then there's no place to house people. And that's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, hi, Tom Hamline, Help USA. Um, I just wanted to say how uh, interested I am in, in the program that you were describing with uh, working with jails and mental health, mentally ill populations who are in jail. I know Commissioner Banks was speaking this morning about his uh, concern with the way the New York City shelter system is the housing option of last resort for hospital release for whatever is left of mental health hospital release and for um, a jail release, for example, people out of Rikers. And I think we're chewing up a lot of resources and duplicating systems by having people come into shelter for four to six to eight to 14 months and then trying to make another housing placement and uh, it would be wonderful if we were able to have creative systems working with our, our, um, our Department of Corrections and with uh, hospital systems to move quickly and cut that shelter stay out. We don't need to do it, and it would be great if we didn't have to. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I guess uh, in response to that, it wasn't a question per se, but, um, you know, the. Again, the beauty of the flexible housing subsidy pool is uh, financial resources from multiple sectors can be put into the pool um, and serve uh, people who may be, in fact, cycling through different systems, but who, in any case, um, you know, are when exiting a system, don't have access to community-based supports and, in particular, to affordable housing. Uh, we have a couple of different funding streams that are serving people with justice involvement. One in particular is a program called Breaking Barriers. I guess we can't call it a pilot anymore, but Breaking Barriers is an innovative partnership with DHS and the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool uh, and county probation. We had um, great startup funding from uh, Hilton Foundation. And Breaking Barriers combines intensive case management services with the property-related tenant services from landlord engagement to housing retention. 
The only real difference uh, in this case is that we're providing the intensive case management services and we're able to subcontract for employment services for, uh, for the program participants. So that's an example, I think it's a replicable and scalable example um, of the way that this type of program, I think back to a couple years ago where the Corporation for Supportive Housing had a, I think their tagline for one of their conferences was supportive housing as a platform. And I think you can see that the flexible housing subsidy pool can be a platform to serve multiple populations. I think that the mayor is similar to the way uh, we put together home base mm -hmm. prevention program a number of years ago with different resources and different availability of treatment models, including cash embedded in a home base budget. And this is the other end of that. This is once people are in the system, how do we get them out quickly? The, 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 you know, it's easy to count the wins in terms of people that, uh, you know, don't, um, don't re-offend, and it's easy to count the wins in terms of people that secure, you know, their own housing and have their own lease. But staff have reported to me that another win is that at the beginning of the Breaking Barriers Partnership, uh, there really were different cultures uh, represented around the table. And now we have uh, folks at probation that really speak the language of housing first and permanent supportive housing. That's another maybe un... Um, under-recognized element of systems change, where people begin to get it and it's working, uh, and then they re-up. I think, uh, you know, my perspective, one of the reasons I was very excited to be able to introduce this panel is, you know, in a city as uh, complex uh, and as large as New York City, I think it's, it's uh, very important that uh, none of us become enamored of a magic bullet but that we are particularly open to uh, piecing together, but that we're also equally unafraid of trying new things because I think that the solution is as likely to be as complex as the problems. You know, you heard Dr. Katz <laughs> talk about the uh, individual nature of patients and that we need to really think about where the patient is. I think to some degree we have a very, uh, you know, we have a different array of how of populations and of potential solutions to that population. So I think thinking about the population of inappropriately hospitalized uh, patients, not that they were inappropriately hospitalized to begin with, but have now had their medical issues taken care of and remain inappropriate hospitalized, that these are kinds of solutions that we don't see this as a, sort of the solution for like all supportive housing writ large, but that we really think about it, what are the aspects here that we can apply to patients that we have here in New York City or uh, in other institutions that are under our care where we can start to move people? And that we begin to weave together a fabric of innovations uh, without expecting any one of those innovations to necessarily be the solution for all uh, for all these very complex issues that is our uh, homeless problem here in New York, where in fact, uh, you know, the homeless problem here in New York looks, looks very different than it did uh, 30 years ago, right? And there, there's an incredible amount of economic uh, reasons, not health reasons. And so we, let's piece together and connect these things. Hi, I'm Rachel Baron Van Cleve with the <coughs> New York State Department of Health. And I'm interested in learning more about eligibility for your program, if this is serving anyone who's homeless or if you're targeting people who are referred by hospitals, uh, meeting certain criteria. Um, if you could say a little bit more about that. Thank you. I'll, I'll give a very big, uh, big picture statement. It's too bad uh, Dr. Katz had to leave. He would have um, his perspective from the initial launch of the flexible housing uh, subsidy pool. Initially, the program was able to serve DHS patients. And I think over time, not only because it was set up to be a pool and other, uh, other jurisdictions, other county agencies, managed care plan, et cetera, have been able to buy in, were able to serve those individuals. Actually, uh, the county itself, DHS itself, can serve a broader array of individuals uh, in part through uh, the Medi-Cal expansion and something in California called whole person care. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we tend to be rather loose in our language about who's eligible for the flexible housing subsidy pool. 
Um, it's obviously people who are cycling through multiple health sector and other sector institutional settings or high utilizers. Um, in fact, that was the initial eligibility uh, language was high, high frequency utilizers of public health services. And now it's, it's much more broadly defined and it's certainly individuals who are experiencing homelessness. I don't know, um, Danielle or Chris, do you guys want to add anything at all to the eligibility criteria? Thank you, Danielle. And I wanted to extend my uh, apologies. Dr. Katz is uh, giving an award, so he had to leave to be on time for that next commitment. Uh, so he left early, but I'm ha happy to take additional questions. Sure. You've got half of the team here. <laughs> Hi, Meryl Weinberg again, sorry. I just have one more question. Did you measure any clinical outcomes or obtain any clinical outcomes? Um, there have been a couple of different um, evaluation studies, um, and the most I think the, this RAND the most recent study, and and the RAND study, which uh, we can we can make available, provide a link if people uh, give their information, did look at cost savings, uh, service utilization, and things of that sort. Um, at Brilliant Corners is not. Uh, the outcomes that we're measuring uh, do not include health outcomes. Am I correct saying that? Yeah. We're measuring housing outcomes, so we're not tracking those inside of our agency, per se. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Steve Berg with the National Alliance Stand Homelessness. Uh, Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you um, again. So we have people all over the country who are trying to replicate what you're doing with a sort of a landlord-facing workforce who can sort of speak landlordese. And, and a problem people are having right now is frankly hiring people to do the work. Just the employment rate is low, the, any, trying to hire people with any level of experience is turning out to be very difficult. Do you, can you put people to work if they're like fresh out of college and don't have experience? Can you put people to work if they've been homeless and come through a program and got their lives back together? How, how does that work? This is such a timely question, Steve, and thank you for it. Um, for years, uh, I will say that personally, I felt that, and I can remember sitting in a conference room in San Francisco and we were hiring up for what Dr. Katz and his partners in San Francisco at the time called a scattered site, rental, uh, scattered site supportive housing and rental subsidy administration program that the city and county of San Francisco launched under a Department of Justice settlement to get people out of Laguna Honda Hospital and another city hospital. And we sat around the conference table and thought about our staffing plan and said, well, we're, we're going to need at least one real estate shark um, that maybe wouldn't have the sort of nonprofit uh, you know, intentionality, if you will, of social justice and social service. We really have changed our thinking, and I, I look to um, my colleagues here for that. We realize that we don't necessarily need all of the members of our housing acquisitions team to have any particular background in real estate or corporate leasing or property management or any of those sort of Venn diagram related fields, but they do have to be great at customer service and salespersonship. Um, and that's a real, you know, it's taken us years 
Uh, and frankly, I never got there to have that light bulb go on. And again, with our scale, we are able to promote from within. And sometimes we have somebody who's in, frankly, an entry level position, uh, neither clinical or real estate sort of uh, background, if you will, or credentialing. But they understand our program, they understand our, uh, the populations that we're serving, they are interacting with property managers and landlords, but most critically, they demonstrate that sort of DNA that we're looking for, or that core competency that we're looking for around customer service. Um, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that somewhere within our organization, which we do have, we don't need people that actually have a certain type of credentialing and can get out there and uh, mingle, if you will, with the other suits that maybe have large inventories. But generally speaking, in a program that's uh, ongoing like this, we're finding that it's really more about customer service. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would throw there is that across the nation, certainly in San Francisco, Bay Area, and LA, uh, it's hard running government-funded human services programs to attract and retain talent. And, you know, and it really does come down to money. Um, so this is not an exception to that general challenge. Uh, but I don't think it's that we need to bring in people at six figures uh, who've really spent their careers uh, in corporate leasing, for example. So I really agree with what you said, where you, you can't have the housing worker doing the clinical ICM, typical uh, workday. Um, so from an auditing standpoint, we tend to look at the client um, individually instead of across uh, program. We look at compliance instead of program performance. So how do you work with the behavioral health organization or the healthcare organization to get the file together for auditors? Um, just because I really believe in what you said and I would love to separate out housing from um, clinical social work, but I just need to figure out how to merge the paperwork for, the, from the auditing standpoint. Um, you know, for most of our programs, we don't have a challenge in that area. We, we do have uh, program audits and fiscal audits. Our teams do a, a great job of preparing for those audits. Uh, even though we're saying that our housing coordination team, they're non-clinical, um, they're, they're taking a type of case notes, they maintain rigorous files um, that ensure compliance with our government contracts. We're not doing medical billing. So we don't have that challenge. We may get there as an organization, but yeah, right now really we're like not doing service planning with all of the the subsidy and everything. It usually needs to be in one file. So I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Oh, all right. Oh, I think I'll make it ahead. very quick. Yeah. Um, so kind of in looking at the continuum of care for people who are homeless or unstably housed and have chronic medical conditions, there are some gaps. And so we talked about one, uh, Dr. Gill mentioned medical respite. Um, there's also maybe this kind of higher level gap below for people who don't quite qualify for nursing homes, um, but need more support. Um, and, and so I just kind of wanted to, to identify that gap. But I'm wondering, we also have a problem with nursing homes rejecting people because they're homeless or because they have an active substance use disorder. Have you done any work with nursing homes and kind of pairing them with some of the intensive case management services? Or is there any kind of model that you're aware of to provide support so that people who need to be in nursing homes can be with, um, with having a little bit of extra support? Um, I don't think that we're doing anything within the flex pool that sort of resonates with that. Am I, am I mistaken? Uh, yeah, the, the most that we're doing is we're using the flex pool to collaborate uh, with former operators of maybe boarding care and some of the care life sites for the DHS and the whole site and then not have that issue of like, you know, and in that role, we're sort of, a, uh, you know, a, not a housing broker, you would say like a resource broker where the site might be available and DHS might need time to stand up a new, a new operator, right? But we're able to control that site for them. And the other thing I just wanted to add, you know, is sort of thinking about a, I, every day I have to think about both the health and the human services side of these equations. And which solution we bring to bear depends on what question you're asking. So on the skills nursing side, this type of program, in fact, 
might not necessarily be the right solution to the question you asked, which is how do we get the, you know, the coming in from the homeless side, but might be the right solution to thinking about how is it that we can help somebody who's currently in a skilled nursing facility who's recuperated enough and no longer needs that level of care to be able to exit that to a more appropriate community-based level of care. So again, I want to sort of reframe sort of the, the how the solution looks depends on which question we're trying to answer. And even the same tool might be applied differently depending on how we frame the question. So I, I think a lot of that requires our, our own, you know, our own flexibility. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, I think that there's been attention on getting people out of nursing homes and into the community. There's less attention on people who can't get into nursing homes and that end up getting stuck in hospitals, which isn't a good place for them either. You know, we hear, I'm, I'm, I didn't say, I'm from the Bronx Health and Housing Consortium, so we're kind of bringing together, we're a convener of health, uh, you know, hospitals, managed care, and housing providers. And so this is something that we just continuously hear of problems of, of people who need to be in a skilled nursing facility and can't get in because of their housing status. Nursing homes don't want to take them or because they have a you know, behavioral health issue. So uh, you know, I think that it's, it, it, maybe the solution is the same, but I think it, we need to recognize that it is coming from, from both sides. Absolutely. Thank so you. we are at time. I I want to thank our panelists and the participants for uh, incredible questions. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>